This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the AIPIS show for accredited income property investment specialists and those who aspire to be. If you're a real estate, mortgage, or financial professional, this is the place for you. We'll explore innovative investment analysis, sales, marketing, and income generating strategies for the most historically proven wealth creator, income property. Learn from the experts as they show you how to build a better business and a better life. It is my pleasure to welcome my good buddy, Joseph Brown, who is with Heresy Financial. He's got that fantastic YouTube channel that a lot of you watch, including myself. Want to just bring him on today to talk about the crazy, tragic events we have going on in the world, but also to talk about some broader topics as well. Joe, it's good to see you. Welcome back. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Good to have you. So let's start off with conflict that's obviously been going on in Eastern Europe with Russia, Ukraine. We have Israel. Things are getting pretty hot with China and Taiwan. The world is becoming a pretty unstable place. What are your your current thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, number one, uh, it's it's really devastating. It's it's very easy, I think, as an American to uh, to be emotionally isolated from uh, from what is going on and uh, specifically from the death and suffering. And when that happens, um, I, I think it can be really dangerous for the decisions, especially that policymakers are making, uh, because throughout our whole entire history, we have rarely ever had to deal with blood on our own soil, war on our own soil um, outside of the Civil War, which was you know self-inflicted. So when we see stuff like this happening around the world, it's you know easy to beat the war drum. And I don't like to engage in things that people uh, typically look at as feeling like conspiracy, conspiracy theories. But uh, because many times when you look at, you know, government involvement in things, it's like, is that the result of incompetence or is that malevolence? And for it to be the result of malevolence, you have to have a high degree of competency. You have to have a high degree of organization, um, so many people involved, and you just don't get those types of people and results in bureaucracies, especially the large ones like governments. And so I do typically like to chalk things up to incompetence more often than not. But one thing that you know, you've know you always said is uh, as long as war remains profitable, we're, we're going to, it'll never, it'll be never end. Yeah. Right. Well, ne- right. There, will, there will never be peace. And especially when it's profitable for the people who are making the decisions. Yeah. So just within the last few months, you look at the trades made by members of Congress. They've been investing heavily in defense stocks. You look at what's been happening with Ukraine. The tide of public sentiment has been shifting. More and more people were becoming fed up with the amount of money being sent to Ukraine funding you know, that proxy war. And wouldn't you know that four days after the government shutdown was averted by stopping the funding to Ukraine, we Republicans gave Democrats everything they wanted, no spending cuts outside of cut the funding to Ukraine. Four days later, this whole thing blows up in Israel. And yeah. within a couple of days after that, there is already a bill to send $2 billion to Israel. And the slush fund for the military industrial complex just doesn't stop. And it's shocking to see the amount of bipartisan support for this war, politically speaking. And so the more we have the decision makers with no downside to war and a lot of upside to war, we're going to we're going to continue to see more of it. Yeah. And, you know, the obvious sort of level one thinking on this stuff is the military industrial complex, right? We all know that war is extremely profitable. But after that, we have so many other war profiteers, right? We have all of the big construction companies, the companies that do the rebuilding, the medical industrial complex. I mean, there is just, it's just on and on and on the profiteering. There are just too many entrenched interests. And especially when, since the U.S. is the biggest provider of the military equipment, 
to a lot of these countries, right? Our defense contractors are becoming extremely rich because, you know, a lot of that stuff isn't outsourced because of security clearance issues, right? right. So it, it is made in America, okay? If we can avoid sending American troops and fight these proxy wars, that's just kind of a good financial deal for the profiteers, right? They, there's no American blood and lots of money coming in. But obviously that increases the debt levels and so on and so forth. But I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, how this affects people on a personal level. And I don't mean obviously the loss of life and the devastation mm -hmm. and so forth, but financially speaking, this pushes the price of resources and commodities higher because war is just massively destructive. Things blow up the amount of fuel, the amount of supplies that are used in weapon systems is astronomical. I mean, right. it's just unbelievable. The environmental damage is insane. So what should people be doing about their own financial situation? The likelihood of war being inflationary, I think, is extremely likely, if, if not almost 100% sure, because it increases debt levels, too, in addition to using all the resources, right? You know, talk to us about some of your thoughts there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's start off with just the basic understanding of what inflation is and what causes it. So within economics, it's always ceteris paribus, which is all else being equal. And so let's say we doubled the money supply, that would drastically increase prices of things, all else being equal, because now you have more money floating around. So it takes more money to get the same amount of stuff. Similarly, the exact same effect would take place if you had the same amount of money and then you just cut the amount of stuff in half. Because then again, the relative relationship between the amount of money and the amount of stuff is that you have more money relative to the amount of stuff. And so it takes more money to get that same amount of stuff. And so while we do have like the Fed uh, engaging in deflationary monetary policy right now, they're tightening, they're reducing their balance sheet, they're raising interest rates. You have fiscal policy right now, which is just massively inflationary. Number one, high interest rates are pulling more dollars into circulation through the reverse repo market right now. But number two, you have a destruction of resources. Like you mentioned, massive destruction takes place with war and preparation for war. You have all of the raw materials that are necessary to just make this stuff, all the steel, all the lead, all the copper, all the aluminum, all the gasoline, all the oil, all, like all the raw materials, then to transport it for the express purpose of it being destroyed and right. not just that stuff being destroyed, the destruction of everything that it's used on. So the buildings and then the rebuilding costs of everything, the concrete, the steel, the energy, uh, just to get back up to where you were before. Yeah. Um, and so, like you said, you know, so no real progress is made for humanity, unfortunately. Massive out of setback. Any of this. Yeah, right. right. I mean, I mean, it's crazy when I hear just as a quick aside that, you know, people say, well, war stimulates the economy. That's like saying... <laughs> caffeine stimulates you. Yeah, for a little while it does, but then the crash is you have to pay it back, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it'd be more like uh, uh, more like saying that meth stimulates you. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah you might get that little short-term benefit, bad but it for massively you, right? yeah. decreases your overall life expectancy, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it is uh, It is just massively devastating, um, the economic cost, putting aside all of the, uh, the, the, the human cost. All of those resources, all that energy, all that cost being freely available for other uses allows the price to be at the natural rate, allows people to use it for what it's most profitable for, um, and allows the creation of wealth. And so uh, it just diverts all of this for destruction and makes everything more expensive. Ceteris paribus. So, so, you know, as you know, I've been teaching this philosophy called packaged commodities investing for almost 20 years now. And that whole thesis of it is that look, as real estate investors, we're really not real estate. I don't think real estate's really that great. Okay. I think commodities are great. Okay. And, you know, when I'm in my home now, you look behind me and, you know, what do you see? You see lumber, you see uh, concrete below me, you see petroleum products everywhere, you see copper wire in the walls. In front of me, you see glass and steel. You know, all of these commodities, I might think that they're okay to invest in on a commodities exchange. But when you stick the real estate label on them, you get 30 year cheap finance. Financing. Even now, it's still cheap overall, because when you take into account the tax deductibility and the real rate of inflation, you're still getting paid to borrow, okay? And you get special tax benefits and so on and so forth. So I like to invest in what I call packaged commodities or assembled commodities, right? Mm -hmm. So 
all of this stuff, all of the rebuilding effort after natural disasters, wars, et cetera, that puts upward pressure on the prices of these commodities. Mm -hmm. It also creates more inflationary pressure in the system in so many ways that you alluded to a moment ago. So it, it seems to me like this is good for real estate in at least in locations where it's not going to be destroyed, right? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that gets down to kind of the uh, some of the fundamental economic principles of wealth creation is that the raw copper, let's say, in the ground by itself is worthless until you put in the capital and the labor required to pull it out and refine it and then turn it into a form that is useful, like, you know, into a copper wire. And right. then even that is relatively cheap compared to what you the end result when you take that and you throw it through a, a house with all the lumber and all the drywall and the paint and the design and everything that goes into it, yeah. it turns it into a useful product. And, uh, you know, it is many, many, many times more valuable or infinitely more valuable than the valueless raw material that it starts off with before you get human labor and capital put into You're it. Beginning to sound a little bit like Adam Smith. I'm just pointing that out, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> but that's, that's wealth creation. Yeah. Uh, that's not a zero sum game. There right. was no wealth there before. And through that human input, then you actually have wealth. There's far more wealth today than there was 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And that's the course of human history. It's not a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game, which also means wealth can be destroyed. And it's much harder to create wealth than it is to destroy wealth. I mean, it takes a flick of a match to light a house on fire and destroy all that wealth. And it takes years and labor and capital to create that wealth. And so uh, it is very difficult, which means it is scarce. And when you have uh, external factors imposed on the system that are making resources themselves, thereby also the end product of wealth, way more expensive, that makes all the current stock of wealth much more valuable. Say that again. I like that. When you have external forces artificially imposed on the system, that are making the raw materials and the end products more expensive through the destruction of those resources, mm -hmm. it makes the existing stock of wealth much more valuable. Right. Yeah. Because the scarcity issue mm -hmm. is, is created. Mm -hmm. So what should people do with this knowledge? Well, buy scarce resources. Yeah, right. <laughs> and like you said, that that sometimes can uh, be like the raw materials. I mean, I love a good commodities ETF. Uh, that's something that is literally like zero barrier to entry. Anybody in their 401k, well, pretty much everybody in their 401k could have an option like a, a commodities mutual fund. Now that's like the bare minimum. Yeah. You throw that in your IRA or your brokerage account. You can, you know, maybe get a little bit more specific if you want to go, you know, gold or copper or silver or any of these other uh, resources. But like you said, the more you can get towards that end product where that wealth is put together, that is much more valuable than that initial product that's being used used for those end purposes. Um, and so scarce resources, absolutely. Like in the United States, we have a very different situation than the rest of the world. We have 30 year fixed rate mortgages. <laughs> yep. So that's a scarce makes resource. It, it, yep. Very, very scarce. We've got the rest of the world in this position where mortgage rates are resetting over the next couple of years to you know double or triple what they are right now. People won't be able to afford their payments anymore. Yep. That doesn't happen in the United States. And so it makes, uh, it puts US real estate in a very different situation than the rest of the world. Yeah, well, keep your thought, but I want to also make sure we talk about capital flight and the direction with mm -hmm. all of this geopolitical instability. But go ahead. Yeah, I, I've always said I think the American real estate market is very special. I would love to be talking about investing offshore and, you know, all of these opportunities. I've looked at a zillion of them. I never find them to be as good though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's certainly some reasons to diversify throughout the world. I mean, just look at the stock market. The US stock market is not always the best performing market around the world. And so get some international diversification. Real estate, there are other reasons other than uh, you know pure performance to invest overseas. If you want a place to start working on residency somewhere or second citizenship somewhere, so you have you know uh, you know a little escape plan in your back pocket should things get really really bad. There's reasons to have real estate in other places. Yeah, and uh, of course but, it depends on your level of wealth. Sure, know, definitely. But yeah, 
Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm very versed in all of those options, by the way. I've investigated them thoroughly. <laughs> I'm leaving for Brazil in a couple of days. When I was just in Colombia, I was, mm -hmm. you know, talking with lots of experts there about visas and citizenship and bank accounts and sure. brokerage accounts and all of this stuff. I've done that in many, many places I've visited. You know, I, I know a lot about the, the passports and stuff like that. Um, but so, but I mean, you're you're the best person as well then to confirm that typically those other reasons are specific for those other purposes. Yeah. And if your goal is, uh, you know, the creation and the preservation of wealth through real estate, typically it's going to be, it's going to be us. Um, and that's why we have so much foreign investment in, yeah. uh, in us real estate as well. Yeah. So FDI in the US has always been extremely high foreign direct investment because, mm -hmm. you know, the US has always been considered the Brinks truck of the world. It's where you've got, you know, good rule of law, political stability. You know, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about what has been going on the last many years. But compared to what? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, show me a better option and believe me, I'll be there, <laughs> you know, um, in a, in a New York minute, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I just, I just don't see really better options when you look around the world, you know? Yeah. And there's a good argument to be made that, uh, that will continue for quite a while, especially given what's happening geopolitically around the world right now, yep. the, uh, the increase of war. I mean, there's, there's some parallels that we can see through from world war II to what's going on right now, the American escalation of, war around the rest of the world, it's very, very possible, if not likely, that the devastation, economically speaking, around the rest of the world will, number one, drive more capital into the states. Right. Number two, drive more immigration into the states, which a yep. population increase is absolutely necessary for economic growth. I don't care what anybody says. And, and it's more demand that. for real estate. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Many of those immigrants are not being counted uh, right now uh, when looking at uh, population stats, and they all need a place to live. And so the the stuff going on around the world right now, very reminiscent of uh, World War II, bringing, you know, increasing manufacturing in the states because of the war effort, economic destruction around the world, uh, capital flows into the United States. And so given what's going on, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that continue for a lot longer than many people mm -hmm. expect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's move to some of your other themes. You know, recently on one of my episodes, I shared one of your tweets and I, I thought this was quite interesting, but I'll, I'll let you start where you want. I, I've got that, that tweet up. I can share the screen if you want to start with that or something else. Feel free. I'll, let me give a background to it uh, first, then we can pull up the charts that yeah. I shared. And so I guess we shouldn't call it a tweet anymore. What do we call them now? An X? I, I don't know. And, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, exactly. A post, a, a tweet, an X position. I don't know. Since I started talking about finance and economics on YouTube, which was August of 2019, I've been very adamant, very bullish on residential real estate, not commercial real estate. Even back in 2019, you just look at the number of square square footage of commercial real estate versus the rest of the world. It seemed a little bit out of, out of whack supply and demand. And my tune has never changed on that. And I've always on that note felt like I was in the minority and, uh, you know, the same voices that were calling for a real estate crash in 2019 and 2020 and 2021, they're still doing that today. And I've well, don't I, forget 2015, 20 2016, 2017, <laughs> right. 2018. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, basically uh, I've always tried to look at the data and present my opinion as it looks like the data is saying the direction will go and not tell people on YouTube anything different than I'm telling my friends and my family. And a good example of this is about a year and a half ago, tons of friends and family were asking me, Hey, should I sell right now? Cause I own, or some people were renting. I've been waiting for a crash since 2015. I sold my house in 2016. I've been waiting for a crash. Now I'm getting concerned that it's not going to happen. What should I do? Should I buy now and just bite the bullet? And my advice was always, yes, you need to buy now and definitely don't sell and start renting. And I've got some close friends of mine that a year ago bought at you know 5%. And about six months later, they were like, man, I shouldn't have listened to you. Prices started to drop. I was like, okay, but how much would it have cost you? Because mortgage rates were up by a lot more. And so they locked in a much lower price, monthly speaking, to buy a year ago than, than right now. And I also have friends and family that didn't buy and are now asking me, I can't saying I could have afforded a 20% down payment a couple of years ago, and now I can't even afford to buy anything at all. And so uh, it's this position where three years ago, I was saying the real real estate crisis is that someday people who uh, never bought will, will no longer be able to afford to buy ever. And there'll be a class of renters and landlords. 
and that's it. And if you didn't already own, you will never be able to break into that because prices are going to move away faster than people can save. Before so, you move on, yeah. let me co- let me comment on that for a second. You know, one of the many problems with our psychology as humans is this. And when it comes to the housing market, people always look at the past and they think, gosh, you know, housing is so expensive now. Mm-hmm. Believe me, they thought that in 1975. They thought it in 1980, in 1985, in 1990, in 1995, in 2000, in 2005. Everybody always feels that way, okay? Mm-hmm. They never feel like, oh, you know, housing is cheap. I can get my dream home for nothing and spend 20% of my salary every month. <laughs> right. Nobody ever says that, okay? Right. So, so people always feel like it's too expensive. Mm-hmm. But what they have a very hard time comprehending is how much worse it can get. Mm-hmm. And this is why I think it's so important to travel. I was born in Europe. I only lived there for a year, first year of my life. But I go back there a lot, and I've been to 91 countries around the world, and some of them many times over. I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at real estate around the world and looking for opportunities mm. and just being like a renter or a home buyer and checking things out, right? I've, I've spent a countless mm-hmm. amount of time doing that. So IRS, those a lot of those trips, they are tax deductible, okay? (laughs) Because I really have been doing research. Um, And what I find is that people just don't know how bad it can get, how expensive housing can really be. Because as I always talk about Europe as the example, you know, people in Europe live in crappy little flats and they spend a high percentage of their income paying for those crappy little flats. Yeah. And they have no closet space. They have no space for anything. And, you know, they certainly don't have a front yard and a white picket fence, okay? You know, so people just really have a hard time understanding how little they can get for their mm-hmm. money. They, they think, well, here's how it was in my neighborhood two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, or a couple decades ago. Mm-hmm. But that's not the right comparison. You yeah. just don't know how bad it can. Real estate in America is still cheap. The standard of living is still very high here comparatively. Yeah. Well, I think the main reason why people don't see that is because they they ignore the number. The, really, in my opinion, you could look at this as the only factor that actually matters, which is, you know, it's supply and demand. But for real estate, it's best described as the number of people who need a place to live mm-hmm. and the pl- number of places there are to live. Right. And that's the number one thing that uh, that people ignore. And so I think that let's let's pull up the charts here. So this is a chart of the number of people who own their homes free and clear, which is 42% of all real estate. So when we talk about potential supply, half, almost half of the real estate in America, you just have to take off. You have to get rid of that because none of these people in the current environments are going to get forced out. There's no situation other than death, in which case that these homes are going to come off the market while a new home is not being simultaneously purchased. So somebody who owns their home free and clear, they may sell in order to buy something else. Right. And Um, and an important point to make is that to those people, their houses feel very cheap. Yes. Because they're not they're not paying a mortgage. All they have to pay is taxes and insurance, maybe a little HOA bill. But you know, these people are extremely comfortable. Yes, that's what people don't realize. And as I always say, if you want to have a real estate crash or even a correction for that matter, you have to have millions, if not tens of millions of distressed owners. Mm -hmm. We're not even close. Right. Go ahead. And looking at the people who do have mortgages, which is about half of American real estate, we can see that 90% of these mortgages that currently exist have a rate below 5%. It's well, insane. Also, also so very comfortable. None yeah. of these people are going to move for an 8% mortgage. Yep. Now, let's say that some really bad things happen economically and the Fed doesn't lower rates and you yep. get the top percentage feeling stressed. We still have two thirds of people with mortgages under 4%. Mm-hmm. Most people who own a home would have to pay significantly more to move out in rent. Yeah. It's the wrong comparison to look at current mortgage payments on average for a new home versus current rents. That's the wrong comparison. We have to look at what most people are paying currently versus rents. Because in the great financial crisis, you could walk away from your home and you could save a thousand bucks to two thousand bucks a month to walk away from your home and go rent. 
Well, and, and it's, it actually was better than that during the, the great financial crisis. You could stay in your home for a year or two and not pay for Nothing. anything. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> then lastly, we get to supply and demand, which is the people of, uh, who need a place to live versus the number of places that there are to live. So this is one way to look at that. This is housing production. This is housing starts. We can see that since 1970, this has been on the decline. Um, and we've had a little bit of a rebound since 2010. But it's nowhere near what the average was from 1990, you know, uh, forward. We've just broken the bottom uh, in 1990. So we're nowhere near the long term average of housing production where the population growth has been the same. So that's why housing starts as a per sh as a share of population has gone down. Now, I would like to bring up a counter uh, counterpoint to this that uh, that somebody has shared which is total housing units versus total population, which looks like it has been increasing. So people look at this and say, okay, well, if you take a look at all the housing units compared to the population, we're actually uh, on, a, on an all-time high. So this is not housing starts. This is total housing units. Yeah. The problem with this is this doesn't take into account all the illegal immigration that has happened over the past decade, which is 10 million people, which is a huge percentage of people that need a place to live. The other thing this doesn't take into account is the change in demographics over the last 60 years, which is the number of people per housing unit. Yeah. So 70, 80 years that. ago, yeah. you used to have six Everybody people was married. Yeah, right. Everybody was married and everybody had kids and you yeah. piled people into bedrooms. Yeah. So every house was a three bedroom house with six people in it. Right. Today, it's the exact opposite. You have one or two people living in a housing unit and most of the new housing starts are massive square footage because you have to for profitability for being a builder, but okay. very few words, bedrooms. It's not, it's not profitable to make a small cheap house. Exactly. Okay. And very few bedrooms. You look at a lot of 4,000, 5,000 square foot houses, they're three bedrooms. Yeah. Sometimes they're, they're maybe four. Um, and so uh, when you look at the usability, you can't just look at square footage. You can't right. just look at housing units. You have to take it all into account. There's yeah. fewer people living in every housing unit. There's a lot more population than is currently being counted. Mm -hmm. And there are more people who need a place to live than there are places being built for those people to live. Yeah. So, let me let me give you one more factor that you yeah. didn't mention. A lot of people look at population and the birth rate has definitely been declining. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. Looking at population growth over the past decade or two is not an accurate way to look at it. What you've got to look at is the population growth that happened 30 to 36 years ago because that's household formation today. Mm. So you've got to lag that by over three decades. Millennials love to compare their lives to their baby boomer parents' lives and whine about how bad they have it, right? right. But that's really <laughs> a very inaccurate thing. I mean, you know, they've got some valid complaints. I'm not gonna totally dismiss it, but the millennials are on the slow life plan. So mm -hmm. everything they do is about six years behind schedule. Mm -hmm. So if you want to compare your baby boomer parents at age 30, you have to look at yourself at age 36 millennials. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if your life is comparable in terms of your financial life, then you're not getting a raw deal. OK, so that's the comparison. Then millennials will say, well, you know, our parents didn't have student loans and, you know, they're right. College is, is a scam. OK, it's a it's a ripoff. Mm -hmm. But guess what your parents did have that you don't have is a huge expense. Children. <laughs> OK, <Right. laughs> um, you know, and uh, I would venture to say that children are more expensive than student loans. Uh, long overall. term. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I mean, you're having children, but you're doing it six years later. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything six years behind schedule. OK, you know, yeah. you were all digital nomads for six years. You saw the whole world. Your parents didn't get to do that. OK, so, you know, it's just different. Right. Yeah. So, well, also that, you know, a lot of people say, OK, well, that six year lag makes a huge difference in the amount of wealth you can accumulate over a long lifetime. But the other thing about that is that by and large, the younger people have not entered into uh, home ownership yeah. yet. Well, so, that's that's that was one of my points is home. Right. I didn't say it, but home ownership, marriage, household formation, you know, whatever. Right. It's yeah. six years behind schedule. Right. Yeah. And so there's a bunch of pent up demand like, yeah. you know, some of this is statistical, but some of this is anecdotal as well. There's a yeah. bunch of pent up demand from people in their 30s and young 40s who have been waiting on the sidelines because they thought it was going to crash. And the moment it becomes affordable again, they'll buy. Yeah. There's a huge amount of people who are renting that would prefer to not rent. 
Right. So that's called shadow demand, mm -hmm. right? During the Great Recession, we heard a lot about shadow supply or shadow inventory because there were homes being held off the market or that were in the foreclosure process. It was moving very slowly and they didn't come onto the market. Right now, we have a lot of shadow demand. We, you know, we have a lot of millennials that have been living at home or, you know, don't even have a place to live because they're traveling, they're being digital nomads. But, you know, that gets a little tiring at some point or they have roommates and they're ultimately going to split up and, and form their own household, even if mm -hmm. it's a solo household, okay, with just themselves. So yeah. these factors are different and they warrant peeling back the onion and I'm glad you're doing that show. So what else do you want to share from this? You know, what I liked about it is everything you've got to weigh the probability, right? And at the end of your very long X post, you basically say that, look, the possible downside to waiting is less than the possible upside, right? It, or I don't know if I said that right. Anyway, the point is that there's a higher risk you could be suffering more and your affordability could actually get worse because if interest rates come down, it's going to cause prices to go up even more. I mean, it surprised everybody that prices have appreciated during a time when the cost of money has tripled. I mean, right. that's just shocking to most people, but they didn't count on the lock-in effect of all the cheap mortgages out there. And they didn't count on, you know, the issue of there's just no supply. Yeah. I think the downside remains that I've been saying for three years now, if you do not own a home, your personal residence, there's a good chance that if it hasn't happened yet, you'll be prevented from entering the housing market forever, that you will mm -hmm. be you will be a renter forever. You won't be able to break in after yep. that because you don't get any of the upside by renting. Your rent will increase every single year and you will not be able to lock in a payment for the rest of your life with a fixed rate mortgage. If you do buy, there is a chance that things get so economically terrible, devastatingly terrible, that unemployment spikes to a point where we have enough people forced out of the high interest rate mortgages that they bought in the last year that that brings some supply online that forces prices down. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, that would probably be sufficient for a Fed pivot and uh, lowering interest rates. But if that does not happen, there is a chance that prices come down. At some point, though, if that continues, you just let that play out long enough, prices come down fast enough. Everything else would have had to get so bad that you do eventually get the lowering of the interest rates because a recession, depression, prices collapsing is a reversal of inflation. That is deflation. And right. if we get deflation, the Fed doesn't have to fight inflation anymore, which means they can keep positive, positive real rates right. while pushing interest rates down to 1%. In which case, then you can refinance and you can lower your monthly payment. And so to me, it seems that the potential downside to staying out of the real estate market outweighs the downside to stepping in. Yeah. And even in the cyclical markets where the risk is higher, your area, Phoenix, for one, but definitely, you know, the West Coast of the United States, the expensive Northeastern markets and South Florida, where I am, these markets have softened a bit and adjusted a bit because they've reached just insane highs. With everything you said, I'd say that risk is higher in those markets. But if you're buying an entry level house in a linear market, your risk is pretty low to the downside overall when you look at the real cost of housing, the payment, the opportunity to refinance, et cetera, et cetera, versus the possibility of waiting and the fact that there, there's just so little of that inventory being built and it's been in such short supply and it just can't be economically built anymore. The builders, they can't afford to build those low cost houses. So right. it's, it's a very interesting scenario. On top of all this, sales activity is way down. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere from 15 to 30% or so, you know, depending on what market you're talking about. So the realtors are starving. The mortgage people are yeah. starving. Yeah. They're complaining like crazy, but don't let that influence you too much because that does not tell you the dynamics of the housing market and the supply demand issues right. and all that. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And one final point about that. People always say prices are set on the margins. So even if supply and demand is way down, a number of sales are way down. If that house sells for you know half of its current price, you know uh, of what what you thought it should sell for, then that's a housing crash. And it's like technically yes, but <laughs> if you don't sell it, it's not a crash. If you just it, hang on and stay for anybody yeah. who's not being forced out, which is almost everybody, right. it doesn't matter. You have to weigh personally, should I rent or should I buy? And should I lock in my payment for the next 30 years? Or should I have an increase in payment for the next 30 years? And will there be inflation or deflation over the long term? 
Yeah, very interesting. Joe, I didn't want to dominate the conversation totally with the real estate stuff, but just talk to us for a moment before you go about any other things that you're working on, what you're seeing in the markets and in the economy, just, you know, free form, whatever you want. Sure. Yeah. I think right now, the biggest thing short term that we need to pay attention to is government borrowing and where they're getting the money from. Um, and so there's this facility at the Fed called the reverse repo facility. Right. Um, basically, this is a an account that the Fed has that financial institutions can park cash. And right now they're getting paid 5.3% on that which is insane. And it's if you put your money in a money market account or a high yield savings account, many times that's where the banks are and the financial institutions are parking the cash. They give you you know, the a little bit uh, or most of that. Um, and then they keep the difference. Right now they're getting paid 5.3%. The government borrowing is just insane. For anybody who hasn't looked, go to the government's website, the treasury's website, the you know debtclock.org, and you can see just the massive increase and in the speed at which the government is borrowing more and more money right 33 now. 33 trillion and counting. Yeah. And counting. Just the other day, they did like $275 billion in one day. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely astounding numbers. A lot of this is at the short end of the curve. So they're borrowing for four weeks at a time, eight weeks at a time, then they have to pay it back by borrowing new. They're, you know, this debt is rolling over every couple of months. The reason why they're borrowing at the short end is because rates at the short end, they're paying like five and a half percent. So where they're getting that money from, who's lending that money to them is all the cash that's in the reverse repo facility. There used to be $2.3 trillion in the reverse repo facility, getting paid that uh, risk-free money straight from the Fed. But once the government starts borrowing at a little bit higher rates, it becomes more attractive than to stay in the reverse repo facility. So that money goes, the financial institutions instead, they decide to lend that money to the government for the short-term one-month, two-month loans. And so there's now only about- The same is really true with treasuries. I mean, that's the inverted yield curve. Yes. Yes. So- Right, right. And so um, the long term debt is not as attractive right now, because if I have cash, I can loan it to the government for a month and get five and a half percent or 30 years and get four, four and a half percent. So it's like, why would I (laughs) take on that risk of loaning for 30 years when I can get a better return for only uh, one month? Right. And so that's where all the money is going right now. And they're getting it primarily. It's coming out of the reverse repo facility to give you a picture of the amount the reverse repo facility had $2.3 trillion in it six months ago. Today, it has $1.3 trillion in it. So in six okay. months, $1 trillion has left the reverse repo facility and been lent to the US government instead because it's just attractive enough. At the rate at which the government is borrowing, it has, in my opinion, at most six months left before all the money decides to leave the reverse repo facility and lend itself to the government instead. But once that happens, there's no additional cash in the system to do that. So government borrowing rates skyrocket after that. So short-term government Which, borrowing Which, by the rates, way, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I think that's one of the big pressures for a Fed pivot. Am I mm-hmm. wrong? Well, it will be, yes. I mean, the I, government I, doesn't want its cost of borrowing to be high. Right. right? Yeah. The, the, technically, I mean, the government doesn't care about its cost of borrowing as long as it can continue to borrow because it just borrows more to pay off that high cost debt. Um, you know, some would call that a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> or check kiting. It's more like exactly. check kiting than a Ponzi yeah. scheme. But yeah. right, right. I don't even know if anybody knows what check kiting is. But in the old days, probably not. But in the, yeah, you, you it used just, to be able age, to yeah. <laughs> write a check and it took, you know, five days or a week or even two weeks uh-huh. to clear. And then someone could write another check. This was illegal. Okay. Uh-huh. And you could write another check. And before it cash, you could just move these checks around and, and never pay the bill. But, right. But, yeah. Yeah. Some big schemes played on the back of that. Right. Um, so the the point at which they do care is when they go to borrow at, let's say, 6%, 7%, and suddenly there's nobody there to lend to them. And so government debt goes no bid. So mm-hmm. rates skyrocket to 15, 20, 30% because there's nobody, no cash left to lend to them. Right. That's when the Fed does step back in, either by choice or by force from the government to print the money to lend to the government. That's when the pivot happens. But until that point, rates are going much, much, much higher. And that translates to higher rates for everybody else. So long-term, we definitely have inflation because there's no other way than printing that this is going to be resolved. So definitely inflation long-term. We could see some very big dislocation and massive trouble in the treasury markets short-term ahead of that. 
Interesting. One last thing for you, Joe, and I appreciate you sticking around for this, but that is the yield curve because you've mm -hmm. kind of alluded to it here, or at least I did. So many will say that yield curve inversion predicts recession. Mm -hmm. And that may be true for an overall recession that, you know, hasn't been officially declared. And it's certainly hard to have a recession when you, you the unemployment market is just like a non-issue, you know. So, but some people kind of confuse it when it comes to housing because they, they said, yeah, oh, inverted yield curve, inverted yield curve. That means the housing market's going to crash. I don't think any of these 90% of the country with mortgages at sub 5% rates or 42% of the country with no mortgage at all, they don't care about the yield curve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, right. like, why are we talking about this sort of obtuse thing? They yeah. care about their payment is cheaper now than it would be if they do something else by yeah. a long shot. It's cheaper. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, do you want to comment on the inverted yield curve? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, a big sign of economic pain that won't hit the real estate market. And the reason why is exactly what you just said, because American households are loaded up with debt. So you take the half of Americans almost who have no mortgage and you take the, you know, uh, the huge percentage with mortgage rates under 4%. And then you look at their budgets. You look at their credit card balances. You look at their car loans because they haven't had this mortgage debt. They're still highly leveraged. And yeah. so when push comes to shove and people no longer are able to afford to pay all the bills, they're going to stop paying their credit cards first. Then if push comes to shove, they're going to stop paying their car loans. Their homes are going to be the last thing they'll walk away from because that would result in more economic pain than walking away from the other stuff, which means we'll see it coming from a mile away. Right. And the only reason it hasn't happened yet is because, like you talked about the jobs market, heavily skewed. The jobs market is actually not very strong right now. Full-time employment over the last three months is down by 692,000 jobs, full-time jobs lost. Jobs are increasing because people are replacing those full-time jobs with multiple part-time jobs. Yeah, so they, it's the gig economy, sure. Not only that, but the struggling households, you're working at McDonald's and you're working at Taco Bell and you're working at Wendy's. So you right. look like three jobs to the establishment, yeah. but it's only you and you're working way more just to make ends meet. Right. And so the stock market, heavy risk to the downside, lots of economic pain coming, but the housing market is going to be almost fully insulated from that because nobody's going to walk away from that first. You're going to let your expensive stuff go first. And they've got 28 years left on those cheap mortgages. So <laughs> exactly. it's uh, it's not going to cure itself anytime soon. But one of the things I do want to say about the jobs issue, and I've heard that analysis before, of course, just like the CPI or all the government stats, you know, I had John Williams, the founder of Shadow Stats on, on my mm -hmm. show before. And, you know, I, I get it. But a lot of jobs aren't counted also. Okay. And right. that is because of the gig economy. So if someone's yeah. making money with Uber, Fiverr, TaskRabbit, people have become pretty innovative about putting odd jobs together and mm -hmm. getting by on that. You know, some are doing especially quite young well people. with it, actually. Especially young people. There's yeah. very right. few young people who want to go the traditional route of get good grades, go to college, get a job and have a career for 40 years and, and get Agreed. a golden watch. Yeah. Agreed. But a lot of that stuff isn't really counted very well. Right. Yet people are getting by on it and some are actually doing pretty well on it. You know it's a big issue that. because yeah. the IRS in the last year to two years has started to track and look at and require reporting for payments above $600. Yeah. Right. And so it's enough of an issue where the IRS is saying we're losing out on taxable income because we're yeah. not finding all the people who have taxable income that are getting it through these through these apps. And so that's why it's reported now. It was always taxable. If, it's, if you make over $600, sure. it's always been taxable, but it hasn't been reported yeah. in the past. And so- enough people are making their money that way now in an uncounted way, but they're trying to make it reportable now. People have to realize it's kind of hard to be unemployed nowadays, you know, unless you really want to be. If you're just a slacker, then okay, you can be unemployed. But there are so many ways you can easily earn money nowadays with the gig economy. It's it's just pretty great, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great way to to finish it off is that there's this quote by Thomas Babington Macaulay. I believe that I, I might have his name wrong, but I think it's Thomas Babington Macaulay where he says, on what basis can we look back throughout history and see nothing but progress up until this point, yet confidently say that we have nothing but destruction and gloom in the future ahead of us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Statistically speaking, we are better off today than any people on earth has ever been throughout history. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood is that that continues. And while there may be hardship 
in certain places, for some people, that's not going to be the norm. And it never has been. Humans are have have a, a, a knack for figuring out ways to make things better. Yeah, and that's true today. And all you have to do is look at things as opportunities rather than problems to start taking advantage of it. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Joe. I appreciate it. Give out your website. Of course, people can find your great YouTube channel, but give out your website too. Yeah, YouTube channel is Heresy Financial. That's where I put out everything, you know, a couple times a week, put out videos. And then I run Heresy Financial University. So heresyfinancialuniversity.com for uh, more in-depth training. Excellent. Good stuff. Joe Brown, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.